in second in first Peter. Um, this is a verse that I want. I, I would encourage you to um, to really commit to memory and then live it day in and day out. We're going to get into uh, a different aspect in Romans than we have in any other book we've covered. Um, and so I want to start with this verse to help out with why we need to do what we need to do. Now, here's what it says. Verse 15, uh, 1 Peter three fifteen. Uh, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Uh, that is the commission of a believer. I don't care who you are. I don't care what status you have in the church. That is the commission of a believer. There's not a person one that can be excluded from that. And what I want to focus on is the idea of first sanctifying the Lord God in your heart. Set your heart aside for God. You know, we call him Lord. I, I hear it all the time, almost to the point of not liking to hear it anymore. Where, oh, we talked about the Lord. Where's it in the lives? What does it mean to be for him to be Lord? Is it a title? Is it a name? Is it just something? No. If we don't submit to him, then he's not our Lord. If we can't do what he tells us to do, then he's not our Lord. We are our Lord if that's the case. If I have to do what I want to do, not what he tells me, then I've put myself in the position of being my Lord. And so uh, here he says, sanctify the Lord who? God. Now, all through the New Testament, you're going to see Jesus listed as the Lord, the King of kings and Lord of lords, as a matter of fact, none is greater. Well, guess what? Here's a verse that will clearly show you that he is, in fact, Almighty God, like it or lump it. You don't have to agree with it. It'll, I mean, you'd be pretty stupid not to, but you don't have to. Uh, it says what it says. You can't get around it. If you don't like it, tough. He's still who he is, okay? Set him apart in your life. That means make him your Lord. Be submissive to him. When he tells you to say something, say it. When he tells you to do something, do it. No questions asked. No debate. Well, God, I don't really, I don't care. I'm telling you to do it. You know, uh, it's not even up for option. Okay. He says, always, this is, this is basically the idea that to, to follow with it. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Always be ready. Always be ready to give an answer. Now, how do you do that? How can you possibly always be ready? And you're absolutely right, Robert. The Word of God. Get to know the Word of God. Um, I, I, I don't want this to come across as that our feelings and things like that come into play with it. Well, I know God is real because I can feel it in my inner, inner no. What does the word of God stay, say? Stay only with that. Now you can give evidence of that. I've seen God work. And here's how. But always stay with the word of God. Set him apart as Lord. And then always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you. Everyone. If they ask that, it's because they, they're searching. I've been dealing with one particular fellow for months. 
I, I might almost classify it as years. I don't, I don't know how long it's been. And he always asks the questions. And I believe it's because he's searching. He hasn't decided he wants to believe yet. Certainly hasn't put his trust and faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. But if he asks a question, and I have to say, I don't know why I have the hope that I have. What's it going to do to him? He'll turn off to it and probably never come back to it. It's imperative that we, at any point, any time somebody asks us, well, what, why do you have that which you have? That we give an answer. Now, it must be backed up with Scripture. You can ask somebody in one of the cults the reason for the hope that's in them. And they'll give you an answer. They'll give you an answer in a heartbeat. But it doesn't line up with Scripture. So what makes us different than that? If we just do it willy-nilly, then we're not, you know, whatever happens to pop into our mind at the time, then it probably isn't going to work very well. But as long as we are basing it solely on the Word of God, we're good. Now, that being said, I want to jump back over here to Romans chapter 2. This subject is a very touchy subject. A very touchy subject. Um, there are people who will, I have no doubt in my mind, dispute me on this, and I don't care. What we're going to do with it this morning is we're going to look at Scripture and see what it says. Don't go by what I say. Don't go by what you say. Don't go by my thoughts or your thoughts. Go by what Scripture says in this. Now, uh, I am dealing with certain people quite often that are involved in cults. Uh, just this morning, I was accused of being a sinner who wants to be saved anyway. I was like, you bet. You bet, I am. I'm a sinner. I'm not perfect. Here's the catch, you are too. And if you say you have no sin, you make God a liar and the truth isn't in you, so admit it. You're a sinner trying to get to heaven by being good enough. You know, you, you can't do it, okay? Um, what instigated this was somebody judging my statements and coming after me. Uh, they're 100% wrong because you can't be saved by works. You, you have to be saved by grace, and that's all. David? Okay. I I challenge you to judge me. I challenge cultists to judge me. I'll give an answer for the hope that lies within me. I, I'll do it in a heartbeat. I have no problem doing that. I have absolute trust in the blood of Jesus Christ. And so for them to judge me and say that I'm nothing more than a sinner wanting to be saved even though I am a sinner. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's go to the Word of God and see what it says. You know, um, judge me. Judge me all you like. You know, people bring up a verse that Jesus himself brought up. Uh, judge not lest you be judged. But they leave off the next part for the same way that you judge, you will be judged. Okay. I, I, I'm telling you what you're saying is not in accordance with Scripture. Well, what you're saying isn't. Well, okay, let's go to bat and see who's right. Go ahead, judge me in the same way I'm judging you. Have fun judging me. I don't care if you judge me. You know, it's People use it 
only to, uh, you can't tell me I'm wrong. That's all that it's used for. That's not what Jesus was saying at all. That's not what this passage is saying at all. Now we're going to read it, and I want you to understand as we do that I am not, I, I don't have this whole concept down pat. I'm like anybody else. I have this portion of me that's 100% human. <laughs> I don't understand all things every, every time. I can only go by what the Word of God actually says and go with that. So let's see what it says. Therefore, wherefore, let's go back uh, uh, just a little bit where he's talking about, for this reason God gave him up for to vile passions for the women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. <coughs> Men committing what is shameful and receiving themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do the things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, uh, evil-mindedness, their whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, uh, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve, uh, approve of those who practice them. Therefore, you are ex unexcusable, inexcusable, O oh man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. Wow. Now stop and consider that for a minute. How is it that a person who's judging, when God, Jesus himself said, judge a lot, not lest you be judged, because you'll be judged in the same way. How does that add up with this? Okay, okay. That's kind of the concept, Ruby. This is how it works. If I am judging you and telling you that what you believe will get you into hell, and that's all, then I've judged you properly if that's how your beliefs warrant, okay? But if I stand here and I say, well, you're, a, you're an alcoholic, I'm not. Look how good I am. You need to be more like me. Then I have improperly judged that person. I have very much improperly judged that person. Okay? If I tell them what you're doing is a sin. Christ died for that sin. He was buried and he rose again for that sin. And he wants to be your mediator because you're sinning between God and man and point them to Christ, not how good I am, but what Christ did. There's a difference in that kind of judgment. That's something that we all need to be doing. Now, they're going to come back and they're going to say, well, look at what you do. You, and fill in the blank, so we'll say maybe it's, uh, you use bad language. <laughs> yeah, we'll say I do. I, I'm only using this as an example. I pretty much tend not to, 
not to use the expletives, you know, they don't assist anything, but uh, <laughs> um, if I did, yeah, you're right, okay? That doesn't change that you need Christ to cover your sin. It doesn't. Does it make me perfect because Christ died for my sins? And, and I'm covered with the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses me from all sin, making me stand justified before God, though guilty, uh, showing innocent because of the blood of Jesus Christ? No. And I'm certainly not better than that person because I don't do what they're doing. Because guess what? I do things wrong too. Don't beam me with acorns when we leave here this morning because guess what? <laughs> Y'all do too. <laughs> it's just, it's how people are. Huh? Yeah, well, we have more acorns than stones right out here, so that's why I brought acorns into it. Um, but. Well, acorns don't use it in the Bible. <laughs> they sure sting when they come out of a slingshot, though, I found out. Uh, I would encourage you not to be on the receiving end of an acorn out of a slingshot. It's not a whole pile of fun. And I haven't, I haven't done that for years and years and years. Um why are we inexcusable, whoever we are that judge? For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. Why is it the same thing? Because before God, sin is sin. Sin is sin. Is a murderer more sinful than a liar? How many murders does it take to be a murderer? One. First time you do it, you become a, a murderer. Okay. How many times does it take to steal to be a thief? One time. How about... Um, let's do something a little more a little more basic. Somebody who has lustful thoughts to another human being. How many times does it take that to be an adulterer? <laughs> One time, according to Scripture. If you look at it, he uses, he was talking to men, so he told them, if you look at a woman and lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. That's pretty easy to do sometimes, it seems. Now, which one of those sins is worse than the other before God? If, it, if the only sin ever committed on, this, on the whole face of this earth, ever, ever, for all time, was somebody having an impure thought, Christ would have died for that sin. If that was the only one ever, it obviously isn't, but had it been, he would have died to redeem mankind because of that one thing. Let's go back a whole pile of years here, back to Adam and Eve. What destroyed their open relationship with Almighty God? Huh? Disobedience. Disobedience. So somebody disobeys their parent when it says, Obey your mother and father, for this is what? The first commandment with a promise. <laughs> Obey your father and, father and mother is a commandment, so we don't do it. Is that worse than murdering somebody? Better than murdering somebody? No. I mean, we could go back and forth about this all morning. There's not one that's worse than another. So if I do something wrong and I have sin in, you know, ever in my life, who am I 
to judge somebody else that you're not as good as me because I wouldn't do what you're doing. That's what it's getting at right here. Now go back to the original thought of this morning. Always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. Always. Okay, how are we going to do that? How are we going to do that if we don't acknowledge that people sin and that that needs to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ? You know, it, this is a this is not a, an easy thing to deal with. Okay, now the next verse. Back when I first started into the Book of Romans, I suggested that there's going to be places that seem to be a contradiction, but they're not contradictions. This next verse is exactly one of those. Okay, it says, "For not the hearers of the law are justified in the sight of God." But the doers of the law will be justified. Now, that's been used against me I don't know how many times. and Always, always, always inconsistent with Scripture. It doesn't have anything to do with the way it was originally intended. What enables us to keep the law of God? The Holy Spirit moving in. That's it. We talked about this uh, two, maybe three weeks ago. Until the Holy Spirit moves in, we don't have any hope to do that. The Old Testament is rampant from start to finish. It's just rampant with, with people who couldn't do what God said to do adequately to be right with him. If we could, then Jesus was a fool for dying. He was an idiot to do it. We know that he wasn't because that's our only hope. You look at the gospel that saves us, and it deals with Christ dying for our sins. And Jesus didn't want to do it. He kneeled down in the garden right before the, the trials and what have you, leading to the cross. And he said, if there's any other way, Dad, let's do it. There wasn't. So guess what? He did what he had to do. But if we could be good enough, yeah, then why would he need to do that? Okay, Who can keep the law of God? Those that God is working from the inside on. Those that, he, that the Spirit of God dwells in, that Christ dwells in, that the Father dwells in. And I can make a case... We don't have time to do it. We're halfway over halfway done already. <laughs> but that they all live within us. Okay. That is the only way that we can do it. Uh, verse 14. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves who show the work of the law written in their hearts. Now that, how does it get there? It doesn't get there by hearing the law. That is beside it. You know, these, these people that are not Jews that tell me I need to keep the law to be saved, I, I bring up this verse and they don't like it. Because the Gentiles, the law was never really in time. It was given to Israel. <laughs> now, how do we become part of that? And we looked at this briefly in, in Galatians. How does it even matter to us to be that way? Because when we have Christ living within us, we are grafted to the vine and become of Israel. The Bible says that you're not a Jew because you're one outwardly. You're a Jew because you're one inwardly. That's the difference. When we accept Christ, guess what? The law, in fact, does matter. 
And people have said, well, because you don't believe the law can save you, that means you want to sin. No. No. All I'm saying is, is I can't help it and be good enough to save myself by keeping any law. The only way we can is through Christ. Okay. Uh, but, let's see. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. Uh, and this, and, and do you think this, O oh man, that you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to what? Repentance. What does it mean to repent? Most people today, and I'm talking about even Christians, have the idea that to repent means to be sorry for what you did. Not at all. Not at all. To repent means to stop it. Don't, don't do it. You were doing it. Now don't. And people have, have actually told me that you have to repent to be saved. Now let me throw this out there. How are you going to repent if you're not saved because you have nothing to drive you to repentance? It, can, it should be a simultaneous thing. The Holy Spirit moves in. God moves into us and we repent. Well, and, and that's that's the point that I want to bring out with this. It's not us doing this work. It's not us doing this work. It's the Holy Spirit working through us that does all of this that's listed here. We can't keep the law without the Holy Spirit doing it through us. The only one capable of keeping the law of God is God himself. Man can't. Jesus came kept the whole law. Why? Because he's God himself. On foot. A human. Man can't. That's why he had to come. We can't repent unless the Holy Spirit is there to cause conviction and or repentance, whichever. And to stop doing that which we were doing. So that being said, what right do I have to look down my nose at somebody else for something that they do? When I don't even have it down pat myself. I don't got this no sinning thing down perfectly. I've done it before. I... I it happens. We don't have that right. The only one who has that right is Almighty God. And if I love somebody the way I'm supposed to love somebody, I'll judge them right. And again, I, I expect people to judge me. I hope they do. I really do. Real quick, Dave. Okay. Involving judgment, and we probably have to read it all to understand. But it says, um, and if anyone hears my word and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I do not become, I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not our job to be the judge. It's our job to make a, 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 a judgment call and say this person needs to be saved, that person, you can tell by their life, at least I'm going to tell them the gospel. If they're already saved and, and living in sin, that's, I, I don't care. I'm still going to tell them the gospel because they need to hear it. Robert.
It is. It is. It's not for us. It, how, how do we do anything about it anyhow? You know, I, I, I'd suggest to you we have enough trouble dealing with our own sin, not dealing with everybody else's. That is. That is. That's all it is. And, and to glorify Christ in that. Well, let's let's move ahead because it does keep on. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, knowing that the, the goodness of God leads you to repentance, but in accordance with... Huh? Did I? Yeah. He just helped the rich not knowing. Not knowing that the... Thank you. Not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance but in accordance with your with your hardness and your impenitent heart you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and uh, revelation of righteous righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds now does that mean we work for our salvation no that's why I'm saying this is not a contradiction to what it says in Galatians it's not at all. Now, we have to go from here. We have to jump back to um, what Jesus said was going to happen in the end. And look at passages such as Matthew 25, where there's a group of people who did certain things, and they knew it, always out in the open, you know, I, 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 I. And we want credit for that which we did. And he's going to say, depart from me. And you go back to the other group of people and they say, when did we ever do that? God's saying you did it. And they're saying, when did we ever do that? And he says, enter into the joy of my rest it has nothing to do with um, works being our salvation nothing whatsoever what they did and what they didn't do you know he they said we we ministered we went to the hungry we we went visited the visited in prison we gave water we get we did all this stuff they probably did trying to earn their way to salvation he said you didn't do it to me <laughs> you didn't do it to me now the other the other group i i didn't do it I didn't. When did I ever do that to you? When did I give you food? When did I give you drink? When did I clothe you? When did I visit you in prison? I, I never did that. Well, you did it when you did it to these people. You did it for the right reason. Not because of earning salvation, but since the Holy Spirit had moved in being able to do that which they do. And it completely changes things. I'm no longer trying to do it for my salvation. I'm doing it because I am saved. Robert? Okay. That's one of, the, one of my favorite verses right there. Now, does that mean that I'm perfect? No. Not at all. I wish it did. Ideally, that would be the case. But I'm not stupid enough to tell myself, yeah, I am. <laughs> I would hope you're not that dumb either. That we all know that we struggle. And that things are hard. What we do must be determined by our salvation, not for our salvation. The works that it's talking about here... Why uh, are the doers 
of the law and not the hearers of the law, the ones that are justified, because the doers of the law are doing it because the Holy Spirit is in them. They're covered with the blood of Jesus Christ, not for their salvation, but because of their salvation. It's not a contradiction with the book of Galatians. For that matter, it's not a contradiction with another two chapters down the book of Romans. You're going to get into the opposite of it. Now, we're not saved by works. Well, what's it saying here then? That they're doing it because they're saved. Not so they can be saved. That is the difference. Don't ever let anybody fool you into thinking that you need to work and be uh, such and such a person to be able to be saved. No. If that was the case, nobody on this planet could be saved. If I had to present myself as clean before God, I wouldn't need Christ in the first place. I, I wouldn't. None of us would. If I could pull that off, I wouldn't need the blood of Christ. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're right enough. Stand before God. Go ahead. We'd like to see how right you got to be. We, we, Dad and I were talking to one fellow this last week, and the subject of salvation came up. And he said, his question was, well, then, are you saying that I will go to hell? And he, and he was told emphatically, if, if you don't accept Christ, yes. And so I asked him the question. I said, well, you know, what's, what's going to get you to heaven? He said, I'm a good person. That is exactly what he said. How, how good do we need to be? When's enough? Always having a reason for the hope that lies within you based squarely on the Word of God. Christ, our foundation, all else built on Him. Robert? I, I agree. Let me, that's all it is. And then you begin, that's why I've, I've told a lot of um, Seventh-day Adventists, Mormons, and Catholics and Jehovah's Witnesses, I'm not going to get into a theological debate with you. That's not, I don't, want, I don't want to win a theological debate with you. I want you to know the gospel. That's all you need to know. When you get to that point, we'll talk. Okay, um, Let's, let's read a few more verses here while we've still got some time. But in verse 5, but in accordance with, the hardness of, uh, with your hardness and impe impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his works. Here's what he's going to render. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are what? My Bible says self-seeking. Huh. Uh, and do not obey the truth, but obey righteousness, unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also uh, to the Greek. For as many as, I'm going to, well, uh, for there is no partiality with God. 
For as many as have sinned without the law will also, what, perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the uh, hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, also, uh, these although not having the law, are what? A law to themselves. Now, it's not that people are stupid enough that they don't know how to live right. A, a, a non-Christian, a person who's never been saved, a person who is a self-proclaimed atheist even, can be a really good person. Because they know it's stupid to do certain things. And it's wrong to do certain things. And this kind of stuff goes on. Okay, It's not what we do, it's who does it. If I do things, I can go out and do the best of the best if I'm doing it in my power and because I want to be self-glorifying, then I've done it for everything wrong and it is a horrible thing. And that is exactly what the world does. Okay, it, they're not, There's people that are going to dispute that. I don't care. Have at it. Dispute it. The world does it for self-improvement. If the Holy Spirit's working in us and his primary task as the third person of the Godhead is to glorify Jesus Christ and he's doing it, who are we doing it for? Christ, not for self. There's a distinguishing factor in all of this. It's not saying that what we do in that sense is going to matter any more than it did back in Matthew 25 as far as our salvation. It's saying that there's this group of people who do things to be self-serving. There's people who do things to glorify God. Two complete separate camps. Now, those that know the truth are faced with the dilemma. Do I judge them or don't I? How do you get past that with passages such as this? Because if all I'm doing is looking at them and saying I'm not that bad, I wouldn't do that, then I have condemned myself because yes, I would do that. If I'm looking at them and saying by their lifestyle, I see that they need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and lift him up instead of myself. When I, when I say I wouldn't do that, I'm lifting myself up above them. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not us. It's Christ. Um, yeah, yeah. Now, if if we just a second, Dave, if we are doing things to be self-serving, then we're going against everything that Christ told us to do. We're putting ourselves as Lord, not Him. Oh, you bet. <laughs> do do we not struggle with that till the day we die? I suspect we will, David. You're right. And I wouldn't have to rely on God. He wouldn't have to be there. Christ would have never had to die. It's stupid for him to die if that was the case. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, we know that that's not the case. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for
for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, and this is what they're headed for, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, on every soul of man who, who does evil, of the Jew first also the Greek. But uh, let's let's just, we got to quit because we're a minute over already, but let, let me throw out this uh, real briefly. What difference does it make what I do? You know, people have accused me for years of saying that because I'm, I say we aren't saved by our works, because of that alone, that I believe it's okay to just go do whatever and sin all we want. And I will stand against that with a tenacity because God said don't. To do what is right and put off what is wrong. And to not, not sin. As we've looked at this today, I've got to ask the question, are there people you know today who live in your community that need a judgment call against them because of what they're doing? You know, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I've got to throw out an example. Paul, when he went to uh, Ephesus, I believe it was Ephesus, um, and they had all the all the um, gods that they were worshiping displayed. And he, they had the one to the unknown god. Huh? Athens, thank you. I knew I wasn't right at that. Uh, I, I knew something wasn't adding up, but thank you. Um, when he went to Athens there. But what did he say to them? That which you're doing is wrong. You're worshiping all these other gods. Was he judging them? You bet. Was he wrong to do it? Not at all, because he needed to tell them the gospel. He wasn't doing it saying, I know the gospel, and guess what? I'm better than you because of it. He was saying, you need to worship the one God. The one that you call unknown is the one that I'm preaching to you today. But he had to make a judgment. What they're doing is wrong. Now, was Paul perfect? He said, the things I don't want to do, I do. The things I do want to do, I don't. You know, the only thing that's going to save me from that is death. So, uh, you know, I mean, was he perfect? No. But he still had to make a judgment call to give the gospel to somebody else. And that's what we need to do today. And get away from the I don't want to be judged idea. Let them judge me. If, I can, if they can show me something where I'm not backing it up from Scripture, then guess what? I need to change that. The judgment was good. If not, I can stand in the face of judgment and do it happily because it's backed up by Scripture. <laughs> Judge me all you want. If there's something really wrong in my life that doesn't add up to Scripture, then I need to be judged. Guess what? They do too. They don't know it, but they do. And I'd suggest to you that we get off that high horse that the world has put us on start humbling ourselves and, and judging people accurately and rightly not that i'm better not that you're worse but there's a sin that i see and i need to tell you the gospel because of it and that's yeah exactly that's exactly it i love you the way christ loved me and loved you too I want you to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. Sure. You know, we're out of time. I wish I, wish I wasn't because we're not done with this, pa with this passage. Uh, it, there'll be a break in it for a week. Come back next week and we'll pick it up. Uh, we obviously, we aren't going to be able to start with the next verse after what we did. We're going to have to go back into this and work our way some more down the line. It's an important part of the book of Romans, and that's why it's at the start. we got to close. We're five minutes over. I'm surprised I haven't had people throwing rocks at me yet. Let's close. Lord, thank you for your love for us, for dying, for caring so much that you came to earth so that we could, too, live with you. Help us to share that with those 
that are in need, not to sit on it and be content in it, grow complacent, and to uh, become proud of ourselves, but to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those that are lost. It's not easy, but we acknowledge that. You can do it through us. Please do. Thank you for what you're going to do in your name. Amen.